There is a place that is spoken about only in whispers. A dark area that spawns the beginnings of urban legends. A place where anything can happen and usually does. During the light of day it hides just outside of you. But when the sun goes down, spirits, creatures of the night, roam free. And things do go bump in the night. It is in every state and every country, and there is no escaping it, no matter how safe you feel behind your locked doors and latched windows. So we invite you to turn down the lights and turn up your radio while we join Dave Schrader and Tim Dennis, your hosts, on a journey into the darkness on the edge of town. Welcome, this is the best in paranormal talk radio. This is Beyond the Darkness. I'm your host, Dave Schrader, along with me, Tim Dennis. I'm excited about tonight's show, Tim. Oh, yes. You know, we've been doing some interesting shows recently on ancient civilizations and histories, mysteries, and people are really taking to it. They, they like this angle and this, uh, this part of um, our culture and the world culture. Uh, and this guest has been somebody that I've wanted to have on for a long time. As a matter of fact, we might be having him visit with us again in the not so distant future on a totally different topic, Tim. Hmm. Totally different. Something that our listeners have been begging for a return of. And that's all I can say at this point. Just teasing okay. it out there. All but right. maybe, maybe sometime in the next month, you'll hear our guest join us again and uh, discuss another book that he was a part of. Um, to give you a quick uh, rundown for the rest of the week, Josie Varga will be with us on Friday. A call from heaven, deathbed visits, angelic visions, and crossings to the other side. Uh, tomorrow, we have Dr. Alexandra Shorin who will be joining us. Have you been hexed, recognizing and breaking curses? Tim, you believe you've been hexed. You believe that there's a, a, a family lineage issue with curses, don't you? I think there's something going on, Dave. Really? Uh, yeah, because yeah. I ha- I have the worst luck in the world. I, I think it depends on you how not. you look at it. Oh uh, yeah, and, and I've been told that. I've been told, <laughs> you know, stay positive. I try. I, I absolutely try to stay positive in every way I can. But but it just no matter how positive I stay, no matter what I try mm-hmm. to do. The worm turns negatively every single time, and I, I can't tell you what it is. Well, you know what's weird is, I mean, you're. Uh, can I say where you're? You, well, you, you got a pretty high up person in your family lineage. I do, yeah, yeah. You can mention it. You mention it. What What was his role? Bernard de Tromley was the fifth, or no, fourth grandmaster of the Knights Templar. So, do you think that maybe he took on a curse that's been passed down through your family? You know, I'm still doing. Um, I'm still doing research on him. And uh-huh. He was he was beheaded in kind of a. Uh, a, a there, it's been reported in one way how he was beheaded, but believe it or not, there's there's an alternate story that actually ties to the Ark of the Covenant. Because at one time, my family was in possession of the Shroud of Turin. Your family was? Yes. Really? Yes. And you didn't invite me over to take a look at it? No. Well, you know, this I. This is I why we're to, not as close as we used, used to. Used to wear it around as a scarf. At one time when I got cold <laughs> turns out winter. It, turns out it's nothing mystical. It was just some ketchup on your face and you wiped yeah. it off on a sheet, right? Yeah, that's yeah. all it was. No. Really. really? So there's yeah. belief that your family was actually in possession of well, no, the they, Shroud of Turin at one point. Yeah, oh, yes, they were. They they were in possession of it at one particular time. But the belief is that Bernard may have lost his head going after the Ark of the Covenant. Wow. Yeah. So it, wow. that that's... Very that, cool. But But... That that is not quote unquote official history mm-hmm. as it's written. The way it's written is that Bernard lost his head while going after treasure for he and his men, and the way it's written is that maybe he got a little too greedy. Mm. So So maybe again, treasure hunting, curses, maybe there's some of this that goes along with it, Tim. Maybe. I don't know. Well, we'll definitely uh, – you got to keep us abreast of this, man. You might – got to start writing this stuff down and share a book, man. People have been waiting for you to do something besides sitting there playing good music. Oh, uh, that's true. Yeah. you got to yeah. get to it, man. Get a book out. Talk about your family lineage, especially if you've got relatives that have been beheaded in search of uh, the lost ark. That's Not everybody's got that in their family, Tim. No. No. no my my no. grandpa bumped his head once uh, leaning over to pick up a pack of Lucky Strikes, but that's about the extent of that. Well – Yeah, so – 
not as not as intriguing as your family history. But we'll talk about hexes and curses. And the good news is, Tim, that uh, Dr. Alexandra Shoren believes uh, yeah. she has ways to break these curses if oh. you believe in them. Well, good. Yeah. So uh, that's something that you can maybe get some relief from. We'll do that tomorrow. So do you believe you've been hexed? Do you believe that you've got a curse? Email me, Dave, at darknessradio.com, because I would love to hear your stories, and we'll share them on a on an upcoming um, Parish Air Monday. So do you believe you've been cursed or hexed? How did you find out, and what did you do to break that spell? But tonight, Tim, tonight we're going on our own Tomb Raider-like quest. So put on your Indiana Jones hat, grab your whip from underneath your bed, and let's go on a journey, shall we? I had one when I was younger. Uh, Douglas Preston is joining us. He is the author of the number one New York Times bestseller, The Lost City of the Monkey God, a true story, a 500-year-old legend, an ancient curse, and a stunning medical mystery, and a pioneering journey into the unknown heart of the world's densest jungle. Douglas Preston is the author of 35 books, both fiction and nonfiction, 16 of which have been New York Times bestsellers. What an overachiever. With several reaching the number one position. Before becoming a writer, he worked as an editor at the American Museum of Natural History in New York and was managing editor editor of Curator Magazine. His first novel, Relic, co-authored with Lincoln Child, was made into a movie by Paramount Pictures, which uh, launched and famed Pendergrass series of his novels. His recent nonfiction book, The Monster of Florence, is also in production as a film. And his latest book, The Lost City of the Monkey God, tells a true story of the discovery of a prehistoric city in the Mosquita Mountains of Honduras. He's here this evening to talk to us about this journey, this find, and all of the strange things that happened to them along the way. Douglas Preston, welcome to Beyond the Darkness. Well, thank you very much. What a fascinating life you've led. What uh, you you were working as an editor. You've you've been in this. What kind of got you into this kind of globe trotting um, archaeological interest that you have? Well, as a kid, I read all those books, you know, by H. Ryder Haggard, you know, King Solomon's Mines, and so forth. And I dreamed of finding lost cities and exploring ancient tombs. Mm-hmm. But then, when I grew up, I realized, gee, you know. All the lost cities and ancient tombs have been found, but it turns out that isn't true. Um, this story, the lost city of the monkey god, actually tells the true story of the discovery of a of a lost city in one of the last scientifically unexplored places on the surface of the earth. And I got to be uh, right there on the expedition that entered the city for the first time. It was quite something. All right, well, talk to us a little bit about this. Give us some of the background and the legend of the lost city of the monkey god and and how this specific story came to your attention. Well, the legend stretches back 500 years, uh, and it's been repeated many times, and there are quite a few variants of it. But it all they all run something like this, that in these extremely rugged mountains where some of the thickest jungle in the world lies on top of, of, ex- of massive mountain chains, that somewhere in this area, there's a lost city called La Ciudad Blanca, the White City, or the Lost City of the Monkey God. And aviators have spoken of glimpsing the ruined ramparts of the city rising above the jungle foliage, and crazy people and drunks and and obsessives, and even archaeologists have gone into the jungle searching for it. Um, So quite a number of them actually never came back out again, because this is one of the most dangerous areas in the world. But uh, the current search that I, was, I participated in started 20 years ago with a guy named Steve Elkins, who is a complete obsessive uh, adventurer, treasure hunter, and filmmaker. And he was sure that he was going to be the guy to find the lost city of the monkey god and film the discovery. And when I met him, I thought, well, he's not going to find anything, but this will make a hilarious story about yet one more failed attempt to find the lost city of the monkey god and boy, was I surprised when he actually found it. Okay. Well, you, you made a great point, you know, that there's so many of these lost cities and forgotten areas um, have been discovered. How do most of these discoveries take place, Doug? Well, most of them take place when local people, well, first of all, archaeologists spend a lot of time in dive bars <laughs> asking questions and buying drinks. And they often hear from local people, oh, yeah, there's a... There's a ruined city out there this away, or there's some big stones over that away. And so local people lead the archaeologists to these ruins. But the problem is that they've already been looted. 
This city was discovered using an extremely advanced high technology uh, that can see through the jungle foliage and map what's on the ground. Right. And I want to get into that. I want to get into that in a little bit. But that's why I wanted to kind of start off with how, because I know there's a lot of controversy over this uh, find and this archaeological spot, too. But I want to I wanted people to kind of really grasp the concept that finding these places is not as easy as everyone thinks. They may have existed. But like you said, um, you know, people share this legend, this local legend. And in most cases, by the time they get there, it's been so well known and looted that there's nothing much remaining or it's in such poor condition. Uh, and and in, in some cases, too, it, it's um, found by mistake, uh, by doing a dig to build or put something in and and then finding these remnants well after you've already started to destroy the um, archaeological find to begin with. Right. I mean, isn't that part of the issue we run into? They start digging in an area to put in a multiplex and boom, all of a sudden they found this lost temple and they've destroyed part of it now by doing this. Yeah, that, that, that happens all the time. Or you have illegal logging in these rainforests that suddenly the loggers uncover, oh, my God, a, an incredible temple filled with sculpture. And, you know, within a week, it's all gone. I mean, this stuff is worth millions of dollars. So it's very, very rare to find. It's almost never heard of to find a completely untouched lost city like this. When people do stumble upon these cities or, or these locations, these uh, digs, if, if Tim and I were to go out into the wilds of uh, Minnesota, the Iron Range, and as we're, we're out bigfooting, looking for something intriguing, we stumble upon this hidden cave with uh, rich gold artifacts and paintings and whatever inside this cave. When we've found this, we've, we've stumbled upon it. Um, are we breaking laws by removing the items and by taking them, or do we suddenly get the claim to these items because of uh, our find? No, you'd be breaking the law, taking them out. The United States has laws that cover archaeological sites on public land, and I'm assuming you'd be probably on public land somewhere in a national forest or whatever. All that stuff is protected. You better not touch any of it. Um, and, and the same is true in Honduras. You know, we, we found this lost city, but uh, all the property, everything in it, all the artifacts belong to the country of Honduras. I know there's a lot of issues, too, when it comes to, like, sunken treasure, right? Uh, some of these ships that went down off the coasts of, of America and Spain and England, they, they finally find these. They do a recovery team. But then the big problem that comes in, a lot of people don't realize, is you've got this recovery team who may have spent millions of dollars to locate and find and pinpoint these locations. But then it becomes uh, a task of deciding who gets true ownership of the items that are found within. Is is that is that the way it goes? Do, do you have to end up, um, you know, placing some kind of bid for uh, ownership or is it just in the glory of being the ones to discover this that uh, brings well, you your fame well, and fortune? Well, on land, it's pretty clear cut. You know, mm -hmm. you don't you don't own the stuff unless you own the land underneath. You don't own the stuff. But in the in the water, it's different. I mean, I have a friend, uh, Greg Bemis, who actually owns the Lusitania. He mm -hmm. bought it at auction. In uh, the early 60s, uh, auctioned by the insurance company, I guess, that, you know, paid off the creditors. And he's been litigating with the Irish government ever since about it, since the Lusitania is in Irish, you know, territorial waters. And, I mean, I think owning the Lusitania has probably just about ruined his life. Well, yeah, anytime you buy a sunken ship, I can't see that that's a great investment. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's, he's a persistent guy, and he he's... Uh, Anyway, that's a that's a whole other story. Um, you know, maybe that's worth a book uh, someday. Right. You know, the, the, his long quest to to re to turn over the Lusitania and see just why it sank. But uh, well, let's let me start to find out a little bit about the area that this lost city uh, resided in. I mean, again. Most of us uh, armchair explorers, right, that uh, are, are sitting comfortably at home watching Raiders of the Lost Ark or Destination Unknown, any of these shows where they go out exploring, you know, our, our only knowledge of these sites is what's spoon-fed to us by Hollywood. Talk to me about Honduras and the Honduran interior. What is the climate and the people like there? Are there really guerrilla um, uh, fighters and freedom fighters in the woods? And what's it like there? Well, it is, in fact, uh, one of the most dangerous areas in the entire surface of the globe. Um, Honduras has one of the highest murder rates in the world. And this, this jungle area, this huge 
area called La Mosquitia, which is not just mountains but swamps and, and all kinds of, you know, just uninhabited areas, is the major cocaine a smuggling point for cocaine coming from South America into the United States. So all the surrounding towns are controlled by violent drug cartels. Mm. So just getting in there is dangerous. But once you're in there, in this jungle, you're no longer in danger from people. You're now facing uh, animals. Um, you have jaguars, you have pumas, mountain lions. You have uh, noxious insects uh, carrying tropical diseases. And worst of all, you have the thickest concentration of venomous snakes probably in the world mm. in these jungles. And these snakes, many of them are fair to lances, which is, what, which is the deadliest snake in the new world. Very aggressive. It will pursue you and bite you and pursue again to bite again. Um, a thousand times more toxic than a rattlesnake and ubiquitous. They're in the leaves. They're in the branches. They're on the ground. And they are always pissed off. <laughs> so what you're telling me, Doug, is that you've got a bit of a death wish. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I don't know. You know, nothing worth doing is is without risk. I don't so believe that at all. If you're going to find a lost city, you're going to have to anticipate that you might get into trouble. And as you know, we did get into a lot of trouble. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about that later in the later in the show. But uh, they they tell you about you, you realize what you have to face. You're, you're kind of going on a lark just to kind of document how this expedition that probably will result in finding nothing but. Uh, overgrown parts of the jungle, maybe a few interesting uh, points of interest, but certainly not the idea of a lost city. But you're hearing about all of the danger. And just, first of all, in the human side of it, drug runners and cartels and gorillas and the, and I don't mean the hairy King Kong kind, I mean the the fighters and, and warriors that are out there. That part, uh, how do you overlook that? Seriously, I mean, I understand there's an intrigue and an excitement, but you know that uh, fellow explorers have gone into this, Doug, and, and have never returned. Well, we... We uh, went in prepared. We had 16 soldiers with us who were heavily armed, oh, okay. special forces soldiers, a hunter and Tazon special forces soldiers who uh, were, were, were there to protect us. So we, we were pretty sure we weren't going to be bothered by drug dealers or criminal gangs. How exactly does one procure uh, an elite task force like that? Are you bringing in American forces? Are you Craigslisting in Honduran looking for, for, you know, protection? How do you find 16 well-armed men to lead you to this uh, forbidden city? Well, you basically, uh, it was a joint Honduran-American expedition. Okay. And we said to them, look, you know, this, we need to cooperate with the Honduran military on this. I mean, the Honduran Air Force had helicopters that we needed. They had the soldiers we needed. And uh, they had the expertise we needed. But we also hired three uh, British um, ex-SAS jungle warfare specialists, the top three guys in the world, actually, very expensive, who, uh, whose job it was to keep us alive in the jungle. And uh, boy, I'll tell you, these guys were tough. Although they're British, so, you know, they drink their tea with their little pinky raised. And, you, you know, you look at them and you say, well, I mean, how tough are these guys really, you know, with a British accent and all that? But on the first night when I saw one of these guys kill a fair to lance snake that was larger than he was with a venom flying through the air. I mean, this snake did not go gently into that good night. I saw that and I said, my God, these guys are tougher than they than we even dreamed they were. Have you not watched James Bond? You should know those guys know how to fight. <laughs> well, you know, you see it on uh, you see it in right. the movies, and you think, well, people aren't really like that. And then when you see someone actually wrestle a snake to the ground that's bigger than he is, with fangs more than an inch long, uh, uh, and and decapitate that snake, and then have to continue to fight the headless snake. <laughs> when you see something like that. You think, wow, you know, there's no CG involved here. This is the real thing. Yeah. Was it at that point on your first day when you saw that happen that you thought, you know what? Maybe I don't need to document this part of the story and I'll just go back home and you, you phone it into me for the rest of the ride. Well, I, I would have been nice. I could have thought that, but there was no getting out. It was a night. Um, you know, the helicopters could only fly in good weather and it rained almost all the time. I mean, once you go out into the jungle, 
there is there isn't going to be any quick evacuation if you change your mind. So, but but this fellow, after he killed that snake, he he had to wash his hands off because the snake got venom all over the back of his hand. His skin was actually bubbling. So he washed his hands oh and he said, God. "Nothing like that to concentrate the mind, is there?" <laughs> wow. All right. Well, I, I've got to know when you're going into a joint venture like this, if the Honduran uh, government knows that you have a, a, that strong of an idea and you're willing to sink that kind of money into finding this location, why do they need you and a couple of uh, British interlopers when they can just go locate this and, and make this historic find themselves? Well, that, that's a good point. But the, the reason is that we had the expertise, we had the archaeologists, we had 10 PhD scientists on the expedition. Wow. And uh, Honduras wanted the credibility of that. Also, I was working for National Geographic magazine, mm-hmm. and they were very interested in, in National Geographic publishing this discovery because it, it created legitimacy. You know, it wasn't just a bunch of hype, or maybe is it true, is it not true? I mean, if Nat Geo publishes something, it's, it's true. You know, it's been vetted by, by the top people. And the Honduran government wanted that kind of legitimacy. What does an expedition like this cost, if you don't mind me getting a ballpark? I mean, you, you sound like you've got a lot involved in this. How, who puts this money together, and, and how much does an expedition like this uh, run somebody? Well, it's probably a couple of million dollars in all. Um, the, the, the expedition came in two parts. The first part was an aerial survey mm-hmm. of these unexplored areas in the mountains, and that cost about a million dollars. And that was financed by a filmmaker named Bill Benenson uh, in California, a very well-known uh, documentary filmmaker who is wanted to film the discovery of this city. And, and he is he's creating a fantastic documentary. Wait till this documentary comes out. It's going to blow your mind. So he financed the initial LIDAR discovery of the city using this powerful technology in 2012. And then... He financed the 2015 ground expedition, which again cost about a million dollars, primarily the expense of operating helicopters. Um, it was, you know, hel- helicopters are very expensive. And when you're going out into a, an, an unexplored area, you're dropping soldiers, they have to cut a landing zone, the hel- a helicopter has to fit into that landing zone. Uh, it, it is, you know, the logistics are pretty, pretty intense. It's a lot of money that has to go into that. Yeah, it would seem. The payout is then he gets the rights to the documentary and uh, and selling that story. Is that kind of where he, he recoups this uh, this expenditure? Exactly. You know, okay. I was the writer, so uh, my expenses were fairly modest compared to his. Um, yeah, he's, he's, he's putting together a documentary in, in about six months to a year. Uh, that documentary will appear and... Hopefully you'll be able to watch it on Netflix or HBO or whoever purchases it. And I'm telling you, it's going to be a wonderful documentary. When you know that you're, you're going into these kind of uh, unbelievable odds, do you guys look at this realistically? Do you sit down the 10 or 12 or 15 of you that are involved in this expedition? And do you say, Hey guys, I, this just to be fair, some of us are not coming home. Is that a reality when you set out to do something like this? It was a reality before we right before we went in. Uh, this head SAS guy named Andrew Wood mm-hmm. got up and he gave us a lecture that sobering is the word. He said, "Look, here's what we're going to face," and he ticked off all the dangers. And then he said, "I'm in charge. This is a quasi-military command structure. You will obey my orders instantly, uh, and I don't care who's who's paying for this. I'm in charge." Mm-hmm. You will do what I say, and that's the only way we can really be sure of keeping you people alive. And you have to understand that bad things are going to happen, and we don't know what they are, but we're as prepared as anyone can be. And, you know, he, he talked about, oh, he just he scared the hell out of us. I would guess. Uh, was there contingency plans laid then if, if somebody goes down? We need to leave them behind and just continue moving forward. Would that end the expedition? How would how would you guys deal with that? There, there were all kinds of contingency plans that were in there, you know, that they had worked out that they didn't really share with us. 
Um, there's just too many things that could go wrong. But uh, the idea behind it was, you know, if, if, if everyone knows what they're supposed to be doing and follows orders, these things are minimized. However, as you know, I'm sure we're going to talk about later, um, we didn't escape uh, unharmed. Um, in fact, the expedition suffered greatly uh, after, you know, after the whole thing was over. It turns out the valley was a hot zone of tropical disease. And, and uh, all the precautions we took did not stop that from, from sickening and even endangering the lives of many people. We'll take a break. We'll come back and we'll discuss the next moves in this. And LIDAR. What is LIDAR? And why is this asterisk kind of associated with this case? Does this form of archaeology and seek and discovery somehow dismiss the importance of what was found? Uh, we'll talk with Douglas Preston, our guest, as we continue. What the deuce? What did the guide say? Him say we go no further. Him say this be an evil place. Him say this beyond the darkness. And we're back. This is Beyond the Darkness on a Wild Wednesday. Douglas Preston, our guest, the author of The Lost City of the Monkey God, a true story. All right, we've heard a little bit about the background of this expedition and what we were going in search of. You mentioned something called LIDAR. Can you give us a little bit of uh, a history on what LIDAR is, Doug, and, and how it was used in this uh, amazing find? Well, LIDAR is uh, short for Light Detection and Ranging, and it's a very powerful uh, technology. Um, and it was used to discover the Lost City in 2012. They had to bring a plane down from the University of Houston – and the guts of this plane had been ripped out, and inside is a million-dollar machine, LIDAR machine. And they fly this plane over the jungle canopy, and it fires hundreds and hundreds of thousands of laser pulses a second down into the canopy and measures the reflection. Mm -hmm. And even in the thickest jungle, there, there are gaps between the leaves. If you lie down... Uh, if you're in the jungle and you lie down on the ground and look up, at, up through the trees, you will see little bits of blue sky here and there. And so what LIDAR does is it, it finds all those little holes. So some of those laser beams reflect off the ground and come back up to the plane. And then using software, they can remove the reflections from the leaves and the trunks and so forth, leaving just the reflection from the ground. And that reveals what's on the ground. So it's like a light sonar. Exactly. That's right. a very good metaphor. All right, great. So you're you're penetrating this area with this heavy duty light source, these laser light points that are bouncing back. So it's much like Tim, it sounds like um kind of like the SLS camera that we use when we investigate paranormal locations, right? Yeah. You're yeah. you're you're banking the entire room with these laser points of light and uh if if it finds something like a human form that's not visible to our eyes, it creates a, an avatar, a stick figure that shows you head, shoulders, knees, and toes that it's pinpointing there's something there. Mm -hmm. So for those of you that have used the SLS camera or have seen it on a myriad of the different paranormal shows, this is this sounds like a much grander scale uh, version. Okay, so they do this flyover, and the first time they do this, Doug, and they, they pinpoint this area, did they have a good working knowledge of where they were going, or did they have to do – numerous flyovers, different locations to try to pinpoint where they thought this, this lost society might be? Well, they did a lot of research. And uh, they first enlisted uh, the NASA in the search. They looked at satellite imagery of the Earth from space. And these NASA scientists identified a valley that they called Target One, which had never been entered, was completely locked in by mountains, scientifically unexplored, and that was where they thought they might find a lost city. But then these, these guys who were paying a million dollars to do this, as insurance, picked two other valleys to survey just in case they didn't find anything in Valley 1, Target 1. So I was part of that expedition. I, I'll never forget on May 5th, 2012, the scientists who were operating the LIDAR uh, machine who were crunching the data, one of these guys was a real – Skeptic. He was rolling his eyes. Oh, lost city. Yeah, really. 
come on, tell us another one. And uh, But he came running out of his bungalow in Honduras, uh, yelling and waving his arms, looking like a raving Christopher Lloyd. <laughs> he said, there's something in the valley. There's something there. We said, what is it? What is it? We're all running now. I'm, I can't, I, I'm not even going to say. You just have to look. So he piled into his room and we looked at these images on his computer. And you didn't have to be an archaeologist to see the pyramids, the plazas, the earthworks, the canals, irrigation canals, terracing, just strung along miles of this river valley. It was unbelievable. I mean, I've been writing about archaeology most of my career, and I've never been part of a discovery like this. Usually there are people crouching in the ground with a toothbrush, you know, brushing dirt away from something. Mm -hmm. That's a discovery. You don't find a lost city. Wow. So, so. You, you've now found this information. You're able to sift through it, make sense of it, and you see that it's not just a, a, a small anomaly, but it's this huge city that that is there. What is the initial reaction of everybody on site when when this information bounces back to you? Well, there was it was just phenomenal. I mean, um, I'll tell you one thing: this scientist who found this, who first saw this image, had been keeping a notebook, meticulous notes, right next to his computer every day, writing down everything he was doing. That's what scientists do. But in the entry for May fifth, the book was lying open right next to the computer. He had written two words only. Holy shit. Gee, I hope it's okay for me to use that word. <laughs> Damn right it is, especially when you're finding something like the lost city of the monkey. God, this is amazing. So they find it. This is it. Now, I'm guessing that this took place um, quite a while before you guys actually made the decision to go do an expedition there. It did. That was in 2012. And then we, we of course, had to report this to the government of Honduras. The president of the country was very excited. And we started making plans to get the permits and to work with the Hondurans to get in there on the ground. Because, you know, seeing it from the air is one thing, but it's not really an archaeological discovery. Right. It's been ground truthed. Ground truthed. That's an interesting uh, word. Can you explain to us what that means? Well, it means that if you think you have something, you have to go there on the ground, stand over it, pick it up and look at it <laughs> okay. and confirm that it's real. All right. So it's just it's being hands on instead of just uh, taking a look at, at this. Um, so, all right. Now you, you've got this expedition. You, you get set up. Your leader has now told you, listen, I don't care who's paying for this. I don't care who's in charge. I am the man. I'm point. When we do this, you do it my way. When I say jump, you say how high and you do it because this is how we're going to navigate this uh, very tumultuous terrain of um, what you've got uh killing diseases out there. You've got insects, jaguars, deadly snakes. You've got drug running cartels that are in this area. Um, so, so this is your man that's going to get you through this group. And now how many people total, including your hired armed uh, military um, group, how many people are going to go on to this expedition? Total about six. There are 16 troops, mm -hmm. not all of whom were with us at, at all times. Okay. And 16, 16 scientists and well, in total, 16 other people. All right. So you had around 32 people that are going to go on this trip and, and get to the site to try to prove that it exists. That's right. But not, not everyone was there at the same time. So, sure. like, for example, the, you know, the day after we arrived, we were dropped in by helicopter. We had to camp in the jungle. That was the night we had that encounter with the snake. The next day, just the small group of us were going to go up to the lost city and see what was there. And uh, we almost didn't make it. Um, it was, uh, we had to cross this river. We had to cut our way through the thickest jungle in the world. And at one point, we came to a giant mud hole, uh, quick mud. You couldn't cross it. It was, it was like a river of mud. And so when going through this, our anthropologist, uh, a woman named uh, Alicia Gonzalez, started sinking. She got caught in quick mud. She was literally going down, the mud bubbling up around her. I saw this. It was like something out of a really bad, you know, 1950s horror film. Right. And it was so funny. She was so calm. She said, excuse me, I'm going down. I am really going 
down. <laughs> and so the, these SAS guys just leapt in there and they wrestled her this way and that way and they finally got her out of the mud. Um, <laughs> it was That was something. That was something. Right, this is something straight out of an old Tarzan movie. So quicksand, quick mud, this is something that is a real uh, concern, a real worry. How do you get across something like that then? Well, they, you very carefully, you can, you can wade through it, but you have, to be, you have to be light on your feet in a way. And what happened to her was she was wearing snake protection, which we all were, and the snake protection she was wearing filled up with mud. So it was like oh. she had an instant pair of cement overshoes. Gotcha. So that was, every movement she made was like sucking her down further. So what, what, what they did, of course, very quickly was to cut some trees and bridge that mud river so that we could walk across without uh, you know, getting sucked under. Now this, I know I'm going to get beat up by our listeners if I don't go back. The first night when the snake attacks, where were you guys? Were you at your campsite and the snake came looking for love that night? Or, or did you guys stumble upon <laughs> it elsewhere? We, uh, I, was, I was the one who stumbled over it. Oh. I was walking back from my little hammock where I'd strung my hammock. It was pitch dark and I had this flashlight and right next to the hammock of one of my buddies, Juan Carlos, it illuminated this gigantic coiled snake in striking position. Mm -hmm. His head was tracking me. His tongue was flickering in and out and I'd walk by him within two feet twice. So I backed up and I said in a very calm voice, although others claim I was yelling, <laughs> I said, hey, you guys, there's a really big snake over here. And so Woody comes over, the, the SAS guy with the, with the four others who were with us. It was just a small group at that point. The soldiers hadn't arrived yet. And he says, oh, blimey, it's a fair to Lance. I'm going to move it. And I thought to myself, move it? Are you kidding me? <laughs> Well, he cut a snake stick out of a piece of wood, a vine or some you know stiff piece of wood, seven feet long with a forked end. And he, in a sudden movement, he pinned the snake. And that's when the snake exploded into action. It's unrolled. It was striking everywhere. Venom was flying out of its fangs. It was really furious. And uh, it turned out to be bigger than he was. So... He managed to work the stick up behind the snake's head. He grabbed it with his hand, but the snake was turning its head and trying to bite him and expelling venom all over the back of his hand, and his skin was starting to bubble. So he wrestled it to the ground, pinned it with his knees, took out his knife, and cut its head off. And then the head continued to snap and spew venom, and the headless snake tried to crawl away. So he had to drag this headless snake back into the light. And What a horror yeah. movie. You know, and, and here's the saddest thing of all. We had a National Geographic photographer and we had a film crew standing there. And they were so horrified that nobody got that on film or got a picture of it. It was oh, only at the end when I said, hey, did anyone get that on film? They were like, oh, my God. And they all rushed off to get their equipment. But, you know. So then, so of course, you went looking for another snake so you could reenact it, right? And we found plenty. Believe me. <laughs> oh, we saw God, no. Doug, so this thing is bigger than your guide. He ends up hacking this thing's head off, uh, getting out there. Now, I've got to ask, again, I'm, I'm not imagining the protective uh, hut of Gilligan and the Skipper here where your, your uh, hammock is strung. What are you doing at night to protect yourselves from snakes in the trees? You said these things are aggressive. And uh, what, what is your protection during sleep to keep safe from these creatures? Well, I slept in the hammock one night. Now, these are kind of high-tech hammocks with mosquito netting and mm -hmm. a fly on top. They keep the rain off. Okay. So the snakes can't get in. But I'm, I'm like, I do not like sleeping swinging from a tree. I'm not a monkey. Right. So I set up a tent and got into the tent, you know, in the mushy mud underneath. But the tent itself also has a, a – it's sewed – it's completely sealed against snakes. Okay. Unfortunately, not sealed against insects. Mm. So um, I remember the first night I was got into my sleeping bag and I taken off all my clothes. And then I realized to my absolute horror that I was completely covered with biting insects, oh. little, little, uh, uh, chiggers, hundreds of them eat burrowing into me. I hadn't noticed it because I'd been walking around with my clothes on and 
covered with mud and it's pouring rain. I just hadn't noticed it. Right. So he gave a yelp and tried to pick them off me and get them out of my sleeping bag. And you know, unfortunately, there's, that's just a losing, a losing proposition. You just have to you have to resign yourself to sleeping with the chiggers. Hmm. All right. Uh, so this is just the kickoff of your vacation. <laughs> I uh, That's enough to send me back home uh, crying. How long does this expedition go from start to finish? Well, we were there for nine days. All right. And uh, yeah, it rained. Uh, it rained, you know, almost all the time. Uh, you're soaked constantly. Right. You, you know, you, I threw away my after the second day, I took off my raincoat, packed it up and never put it on again. Because there was no point. You're already soaked. And having a raincoat over wet clothes is really uncomfortable. So, um, so you know, you just, uh, you just exist. And you know that the time is coming when you'll finally get right. out of that situation. But at the same time, you know, walking into this lost city and seeing what we saw and being the first people in this valley where the animals were so – had never seen people before. There was like – they, they came into our campsite. They walked around. Uh, they were unafraid. I had monkeys in the tree above me that actually tried to drive me out, hanging by their tails and shaking branches and screeching at me. And then when I didn't move, they all lined up on the branch above me, and they were eating what looked like popcorn. And they stared at me for hours, <laughs> watching everything I did. They were totally fascinated. I finally learned what it was like to actually be in the zoo. Right, from the other time. side. Right. <laughs> wow. All right. So, so how long once you guys make this bridge over the quick mud uh, to get over there? What? How long is the trek from your original base camp to the uh, threshold of this lost city? It was about a quarter of a mile. Okay. And it took us about forty-five minutes. Oh, that's it. Okay. Yeah. And, we, and we, we were lucky that we found a landing zone right below the ruins. That's um, right. Actually, the landing zone was kind of right in the middle of this archaeological site mm-hmm. so so we got up there and i have to tell you it was a huge disappointment really why the jungle, the jungle was so thick that even standing at the base of the pyramid we couldn't see it the archaeologist is saying right there is the pyramid we were like where right there 10 feet and you actually had to walk up to it and practically bump your nose into it to find it the, the jungle was so thick that if you put that jungle down in Times Square and put yourself in the middle of it, you could not see any of the buildings around you. You wouldn't even know that there were buildings around you. Wow. So what what then is the case? Now, when you go into this, are you we need to clear this area? Is there certain laws and regulations about chopping down the foliage to get to the actual um, structures? Well, we, we didn't uh, do any clearing or very little clearing. Um, the archaeologist had these really sophisticated GPS machines which showed us where we were. So he would say, okay, over here is the pyramid. Over there is this big earthwork. We're standing in the middle of the plaza, like the, the Times Square of, of the ancient city. And, of course, even though we couldn't really see the, the buildings because they were covered with vines and trees, we, f- we found the artifacts, unbelievable artifacts. I mean, we came at the base of this pyramid we found uh, we came across an area where 52 beautiful stone heads, stone sculptures, were peeking just out of the surface of the earth. Um, and the first thing I saw was this jaguar coming out of the earth, this snarling jaguar. And that was really a, an amazing moment to see that and to realize that underneath us were many, many gorgeous stone sculptures. There were stone thrones. There were great jars uh, covered with carved snakes and vulture heads and things like that, monkeys, beautiful stuff. If this culture existed and these people were so advanced to have built this kind of uh, society, what, what is the belief system? What happened to them? Very interesting question. Uh, they were, they were, they, this civilization grew up on the Maya frontier, so they were the neighbors of the Maya, but they weren't Maya themselves. But they did build pyramids like the Maya, although out of earth instead of out of stone. They played the Maya ball game, you know, that famous game where the losers uh, often lost their heads. And they uh, obviously had rituals like the Maya, but they weren't actually Maya. So nobody knows exactly where they came from, 
um, why, how they built these cities in this very hostile jungle environment or where they went. But when this cache of artifacts was excavated, the archaeologists realized that the city had been abandoned in great haste around 500 years ago. Um, and all these precious objects had been brought and left at the base of the pyramid as an offering and then had been ritually broken, which is normally what they did when they put stuff in graves to release the spirits. But this was not a grave for a person. It was a grave for an entire city. So some terrible catastrophe swept the city, killing most of the people. The survivors brought all their precious objects to this one location, left them, and then walked out, never to be seen again. And then for 500 years, the city just slumbered in, in the jungle until we walked in 500 years later. What is it like to be the first human in 500 years to walk in on this ancient culture and get a glimpse into this forgotten world? You know, I really felt at a certain point we were standing there surrounded by these beautiful sculptures and these mounds and it was raining and there were flowers and there were monkeys in the trees. I suddenly could feel the spirits of the invisible dead of this city thronging. I could just almost imagine what it was like to be here in the heyday of this city when thousands of people lived here. And this whole, it was the it cleared the jungle, the sun was coming in, the, uh, the pyramids stood there, there were religious ceremonies, beautiful decorations. These, these pyramids were, the superstructures were built with beautiful tropical hardwoods, polished and probably draped with remarkable textiles. So they were very dramatic looking and very colorful. So it was, it was something. And then the other interesting thing, and especially to speak about on this show, is the whole idea of the city being cursed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's where I wanted to go next. Now, how did you first find out about this curse? And, and was it something that was, you know, like hieroglyphs or pictograph, uh, pictoglyphs that were put out there that were warning your entrance into the city? Actually, the, 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 curse, the cursed aspect of the city really dates back many centuries to the legend of the lost city because the legend always ended or always was attached to the idea of a curse that after the city was abandoned, um, anyone who dared enter the city would be cursed and die of an illness. And as we were leaving uh, civilization, uh, we had a Honduran helicopter pilot and he turned to me and he said, yeah, my grandmother used to talk to me about the curse of the lost city. She said that the conquistadors went in there and they picked the flowers. And as a result, they all got sick and died. And the location of the city was lost. So he pointed his finger at me and said, don't pick the flowers. Well, when we landed in the landing zone, they had macheted an entire stand of heliconia. I mean, the, the helicopter landed on a bed of cut flowers. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, uh-oh, we're in trouble now. <laughs> <laughs> right. You already kicked in the curse. Now, take me back in time, if you will, because talking about the curse and the weird legend surrounding this, uh, in 1940, there was a journalist that claims to have found this. Can you tell us a little bit about Theodore uh, Mord and, and what happened to him? Yeah, he was uh, he was sent into to the depths of Honduras by the Museum of the American Indian, which is now part of the Smithsonian, to find the lost city of the monkey god. And there have been all kinds of rumors. Other expeditions had reported evidence of it, brought out artifacts. So he went in. He was gone for five months. He came out and he cabled the New York Times, lost city of the monkey god found. And he had gone way up the Patuca River and dissipated, gone way into this unexplored area and claimed what he, he found, what he had claimed was the lost city of the monkey god. And he came back out. And when he got back to New York, he had all these artifacts and had his canoe and all the rest of it. Big excitement. But he refused to reveal the location of the city because he claimed it might be looted, which is reasonable. Right. Then he committed suicide without ever revealing the location of the city, not even to the museum, secretly. So ever since then, people have been desperately searching for this lost city that he found. And he's never left any maps, nothing, except 
his walking stick. And his walking stick, which is still preserved to this day, has a number of mysterious directions carved into it, east 100, south 300, you know, these columns of figures. So dozens of people have taken these directions from the walking stick and have gone into Mesquitia looking for the lost city of the monkey god, the city that he found. And some of these people have never come out again. Um, Did he explain or leave a message behind why he took his own life? He never did. Nobody knows why he took his own life. It was very mysterious. He was at his parents' house in Dartmouth, Massachusetts, and he went in the shower and hung himself. Horrible. Just horrible. All right. So flash forward to your expedition. Do you get there and find, you know, carvings or anything from any of the previous explorers that did stumble upon this location? Well, what we found was that nobody had stumbled on this location before. Uh, Moore had never gotten here. Mm-hmm. And I learned, I learned why later, after we returned from our lost city, and we were wondering, well, where was the evidence that Moore visited the city? Uh, didn't he dig holes, take out some artifacts? I finally got my hands on Mord's journals, which had been under lock and key, protected by his family. People had not been allowed to read these journals, or at least most of them. And I discovered from reading the journals that Mord was a complete fraud, that he didn't find the lost city of the monkey god. He bought those artifacts or, or dug them up on the coast. He went into Honduras with a secret agenda to find gold. And he found gold. He made a huge gold strike in Honduras. And he recorded the location of it in his journals. And I I have that. Uh, God knows the gold might might still be there. Um, It's still a very remote area in Honduras. But this whole lost city thing was a cover up for what he was really doing, which was looking for gold. Mm -hmm. So we solved that one mystery. Interesting. Yeah, I was going to say, how impressed were you? After arriving there and seeing what you had to go through to get there, how impressed were you with that this guy did it back in 1940? Well, we kn- I knew when we got in there that he did not get there in 1940. <laughs> okay. Because he went up the rivers. The rivers are like the highways in the jungle. He went up the rivers. He then w- took his canoe up the creeks. He, he went, you know, he was always on a navigable stream of water. But this, where we found the lost city, is in a valley that is, it's like a crater-shaped valley, completely locked in by absolutely impenetrable mountains, with a slot, a gorge that's the only source of entrance, and there are waterfalls and rapids and all kinds of things. There's no way you can get up that river through that through that gorge into the valley. The only way we could get into the valley was with helicopters. All right, you now know that nobody has found this before. And and when you when you enter this city and you're looking, um things are just exactly as they had been left, right? I mean, there was See that that's what seems so strange to me that yeah, if this legend survived all this time and people had you know left that in a hurry, you would think that locals would have wandered in there in between to kind of loot it out slowly. What do you think kept this place so protected? Well, there are two things. One is just the incredibly rugged nature of the valley. But the second thing, I think, is, honest to God, this curse. Now, the, you know, when I went in there, I didn't believe in the curse. But the valley is a hot zone of disease. And two-thirds of the expedition fell ill with a incurable uh, often fatal tropical disease called mucocutaneous leishmaniasis. And that's obviously the source of the legend that the city was cursed. Now, these indigenous people, these local people, know well enough to leave this place alone. They never came into this valley. Um, we, you know, Conservation International sent biologists into the valley after we found it, and they came back out and said, there's been no human entry in this valley for hundreds of years. And I think the reason is because these indigenous people know about the curse. They've been, you know, they're not stupid. They're staying far away from this place. All right. So let's go back into the expedition itself. You're in this location. You found it. It's, it's covered under the thick, dense 
forest, and, and so much so that you could be standing in front of it, and if you didn't know what you were looking for, it would be cloaked and, and kept secret from you. Now you're in there. Are there? Is this something straight out of a Raiders or Tomb Raider movie? I mean, are you finding secret passageways to enter this these uh, places? And what what is it like on the interior? Well, we found a lot of really intriguing stuff. The first thing we found was this row of altar stones, mm-hmm. big, huge, flat stones um, perched on uh, triads of quartz boulders. Again. So covered in jungle vines and foliage that honestly you, you couldn't see them until you practically tripped over them. But we did clear out this area. We saw that there were these rows of stones lining one side of the plaza. Now, were they for human sacrifice? Were they seats of power? Were they seats for nobles? Were they the foundation of a great building made out of wood? It's, we don't know. And then we found a staircase leading upwards and downwards. The upper part seemed to have washed away, and the lower part went down into the earth. Well, we didn't excavate, and that's not been excavated yet, so we don't know what's down there. But it's right at the base of this earthen pyramid, and it does appear to lead somewhere, uh, but who knows where. And then then the artifacts that were found, these 52 sculptures, uh, once that was that area was cleared, and we started to excavate, And we uncovered not 52 sculptures, but 500 sculptures in this area, with many more still there. Uh, Remarkable. We only excavated 200 square feet. Now, this city covers a a square mile or more. So Hmm. you can just imagine what's there waiting to be uncovered. Uh, Well, yeah. Speaking of uncovering things, what type of uh, indigenous creatures are you unearthing as you're digging through this and and finding this location is it overrun by the local beasts uh snakes and spiders or or is it pretty untouched even by that oh oh yeah we we uh, well as soon as we started uh, clearing the area of sculptures almost right away this feral ants came shooting out from under a log really really pissed off and, and of how, course, how we big had are these? Group with us, so now they finally had their opportunity to film the snakes. Everyone backed off. The snake is coiled up, really angry, going to strike at whatever, whoever, if anyone gets close. Now, the small ones are a lot more venomous than the big ones. So everyone was being very cautious. How big so would these got, creatures he, be? He got photographed. He's a star. Right. How, how big was he? He was probably about maybe a foot and a half, two feet long. Okay, compared to the other one, which was what, seven feet long? Yeah, about six and a half feet, mm-hmm. yeah, six to seven feet. But um, so he was, so then they tried to move him. That was a bad move because he got all mad and escaped mm. being moved and went back under the log that was right in the middle of all these artifacts. So all the archaeologists went on strike. They said, wait, we're not, we're not doing any more work here. Let's forget it. <laughs> so it was a couple of days before they were able to really get in there. And Now, we never saw that snake again. I'm sure he was still under the log, but for some reason he never came out again. Or maybe he moved at night and we didn't see him move. But, but it made everyone really nervous, you know. Usually when you're excavating, you're not worried about being bitten by a feral ants. Right. All right. Um, boy, snakes, creatures, bugs. But everybody seems to be faring well. You're, you haven't lost anybody? Uh, n- no real danger at this point? Or, or have you skipped over a few of the more scary encounters? Well, at night, we had um, animals prowling about our tents. Uh-huh. Uh, jaguars, for example, rumbling and coughing and then... Um, probably a mountain lion that was made this purring sound. And I remember the first night I got up to pee and I uh, went to go outside and I saw that the ground was completely covered with glistening cockroaches. And the cockroaches were rustling and moving around. And then among them were these stationary spiders waiting. And I thought, you know what? I'm not going to drink tea before going to bed ever again. (laughs) Yeah, I don't blame you on that one. Holy God. Uh, oh, man, what a nightmare. Uh, just the idea of what you're going through. But again, this sounds like every Raiders movie ever created, right? Hissing cockroaches, uh, waiting snakes and spiders and, and all kinds of fun beasties. 
Um, <laughs> that that's a uh, that's the amazing part of these uh, points too. Is right, you're you're realizing this has got to be exciting to be going to bed every night. But on the other hand, once you settle down and the the forest comes to life with the sounds of of mountain lions and crickets and and cockroaches and snakes and it's how do you sleep, Doug? What how, was there? Was it Nyquil every night to just try to get through it? I couldn't sleep. I just had a, I, I put in <laughs> earplugs. The jungle is so noisy at night. It's like it's deafening. I mean, it's much noisier at night than it is during the day. And also, I didn't mention to you the other thing was there were some very, very large animals moving around us. These weren't cats. These were really clumsy animals crashing and, you know, cracking the twigs and crashing through the jungle foliage right near our tents, right through them. And it made everyone very nervous because they thought, oh, these, whatever these big animals are, they're going to step on us. And I have no idea what they were, if they're tapers or, or deer or what. I don't, I really had, it's hard to say what these animals were, but they were not light stepping jungle creatures. They were big blundering animals. Bigfoot? <laughs> Yeti. Yeah, I know Sasquatch. Well, was there any kind of legend of of large beings like that? Of course, you are in the kingdom of the monkey god. Are there any large uh, primates that are in that area? Well, there is a legend of the Ulox. And, you know, I'll just tell you the legend and let your viewers decide whether there's any truth to it. But the indigenous people say that there's a race of beings that lives in these very remote jungles that are half monkey, half human. They're a hybrid between apes and humans. And that these apes, many, you know, hundreds of years ago, kidnapped um, women from the tribes, brought them into the jungle, mated with them, and created this race of people, sort of half ape, half uh, uh, human beings. And that these are really dangerous animal creatures that live in the jungle and, uh, you know, are always looking for to kidnap women. So sounds like a legend of Bigfoot being born right there. Um, unbelievable. Let's uh, let's talk a little bit more. Now, how far how far into this were you able to do on this first expedition? How far did you get in? Was it only that two 200 square feet or did you get in much deeper? Well, we, we did a lot of exploration. We were able to explore about 25 uh, percent of the city. Hmm. And there were the, the city actually consists of 19 interconnected like villages or or neighborhoods, mm-hmm. sort of like, you know, any, it's, it's a bit like L.A., you know, it's kind of spread out. And so we went down the river and we explored areas of the city downriver. We explored areas upriver, but there's still areas to explore. I mean, there's one place on the LIDAR images, it shows a magnificent, uh, like, plaza surrounded by mounds on top of a mountain with a big pyramid mm-hmm. on it. And it takes up the entire top of this mountain. And, boy, I'd love – I mean, that has not been explored yet. I I can't wait for them to go there. I'm sure they're going to find some amazing stuff up there. How much of it has been explored now, total? Well, you know, the archaeologists said only about 10% has been really thoroughly mapped. Another 25% has been visited. And about 75% remains unexplored. Were you finding remains of the indigenous people there? Well, here's something very cool. This is some news that is not, you're hearing it on this station for the first time. These biologists just came out from examining species of animals in the valley, and they found a very rare species of bat that only lives in deep caves Mm -hmm. and doesn't fly very far from the mouth of those caves. And they found these bats in the ruins. And they said to me, there are big caves nearby. And the archaeologist said, well, when those caves are found, that's where the necropolis of this civilization will be. Because these people buried their dead in caves. They did not bury them in the ground. They, they put their bones in caves, and they left offerings of pots and gorgeous items and often beautiful items made out of gold. So when those caves are found, they're going to find unbelievable stuff. Do you have any interest in returning for another expedition there? Well, if they find those caves, I'm definitely going back. Even knowing what happened to you and two-thirds of your your group? 
Well, yeah. I mean, first of all, having gotten leishmaniasis, I can't get it again. And secondly, I mean, honestly, the one thing I'm really afraid of are those snakes. That's the one thing. But I right. bought myself a, a pair of really expensive snake uh, gaiters, cost 200 bucks. And uh, I did ask the manufacturer, I said, did you test these against the fair de lance? And they said, no, we didn't. And they're not guaranteed against the fair de lance either. <laughs> but I thought, well, they're, they're still the best made. So, so anyway. All right. Well, let's, I, let's okay. talk about this. I mean, what, Doug, knowing what you know and, and everything about this expedition, what is an acceptable level of danger in the pursuit of discovery? Well, you know, I've done a lot of dangerous things as a journalist, um, taken a lot of risks. And honestly, I feel like if leishmaniasis is the only thing that's going to happen to me, I'm probably ahead of the game. I mean, I've, I, many years ago, I was in Cambodia, um, in Khmer Rouge held territory. Uh, that was a lot more dangerous. Um, landmines, you know, exploring Cambodian temples that have been landmined by the Khmer Rouge. Uh, that, that, that was really dangerous. So, you know, I figure, hey, you know, I survived that, I'll survive this. But, you know, it, it's true. Nothing really worth doing in this crazy world uh, is without risk. I hope that's what they put on your gravestone, Doug. Well, <laughs> it's going I, into these things. I mean, that's crazy. Now, talk to us. I, you made it through the expedition. Was the disease starting to show its ugly head while you were on the expedition, or did it wait until you got home before it unleashed? No, it waited. I'll, I'll never forget, after we came out of the jungle, I was with Steve Elkins, who was the guy who started this whole thing. And we were drinking frosty beers by the pool, and Elkins was mopping his brow, and he said, I can't believe it. Thank God. We got out of the jungle. Nobody got hurt. Nobody was killed. Nobody got sick. Well, his uh, congratulations were premature because about six weeks later, the National Geographic photographer was the one who noticed it first. He sent around an email saying, hey, do any of you guys have a bug bite that isn't going away but looking worse? And we all looked at ourselves and we said, yeah, we do. All the others are fading. But this one's getting worse. And it got worse and worse. It became, it turned from a bug bite into a horrible weeping ulcer, like almost like a volcano. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm probably grossing out some of your listeners Oh, no, that's here, fine. But, It'll keep people home safe where they belong. <laughs> and, you know, this horrible thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I went to the emergency room in the hospital like everyone else did. And the doctor said, oh, it's, it's an infection prescribed us antibiotics, didn't do any good. So finally, Dave Yoder, the Nat Geo photographer, photographed his lesion and emailed it to some other photographers he knew from National Geographic. Mm -hmm. And one guy who'd had leishmaniasis emailed him back and said, Dave, Dave, old boy, you've got leishmaniasis. I hate to tell you. So, so. Now explain Dave, to us what that disease is and, and what is its function? How does it attack the body? Well, it's, a, it's transmitted by sand flies. So the, the sand fly bites you. It, in sucking your blood, it injects these parasites into your skin. And the parasites are eat the flesh, more or less. Okay. Um, they're flesh eating. The disease is sometimes called white leprosy. And so the parasites start eating your flesh and create these horrible lesions on your body. And eventually they move to your face and they attack your nose and your lips. Your nose falls off, your lips slough off, your face becomes an open sore with nothing in it, and eventually it eats the bones of your face until there's just a hole there, and then you die. Well, that's pleasant. How far along <laughs> was it when it got, uh, when you finally started to get some kind of uh, understanding of what you were dealing with? Well, fortunately, uh, we were our disease was attacked in its early stages. And even though it's not curable, it's, it definitely can be controlled with, with uh, treatment. So the National Institutes of Health, which is our, our nation's um, a clinical research uh, facility, um, the greatest in the world, um, decided that we were very interesting and that <laughs> the doctors were very interested in studying us. We were very popular with the doctors, so they all they offered to treat us for free 
even to pay for our airfare and our hotel. Um, because they're studying this disease intensively, they've got a laboratory where they're breeding the sand flies. They're looking at the disease. What? They're trying to come up with a with a vaccine or some kind of treatment for okay. it. Okay. Now you're you're stuck with this disease for all time. Is it kind of like herpes? I mean, you can you can treat it, but you can never really get rid of it. Is it, it's, it's exactly like herpes. If you, well, the treatment is really quite awful. Uh, unfortunately, it's a very difficult treatment. It's a bit like chemotherapy where it makes you sick, sometimes makes you feel like you're dying. Um, but it beats back the disease so that your immune system can kind of uh, keep it in check. Okay. But if your immune system becomes compromised, like if I were to have, if I got cancer and they had to do chemotherapy, the disease would come back. If I had to have an organ transplant and they had to suppress my immune system, the disease would come back. So it's kind of kind of hangs over your head like the sword of Damocles. Oh, jeez. Well, you made it sound like, oh, I had it once, I can't get it again, but that's because you never really got rid of it. <laughs> well, that's exactly right. Okay. You, you can't get it twice. Now, is it transmittable? I mean, can you pass it along to others? Uh, no, it's uh, not. Thank goodness. Uh, it can only be passed through the bite of a particular species of sandfly, and and those that that type of sandfly is only found in the tropics. So how are how are people that live in that area not dropping dead if these things are out there and and doing this? Well, they are. The uh, twenty million people have this disease, and sixty thousand people die of it every year. So it oh, it's a big no. deal, actually. Yeah, you, you, right. you've never heard of it because. It, it's it's only just come into the United States. Just in the 21st century has leishmaniasis crept over the our southern border and entered Texas and Oklahoma. Uh, okay, so the sand flies are now living in the United States? Yes, and uh, it, and it well, also requires a Two more animal. states not to visit, Tim. Oklahoma and Texas. You're dead yeah, to us, they, Oklahoma. They, the Dallas area, they had an outbreak of leishmaniasis a mackerel. few years ago. Caused a, a small panic, but then they got it under control. How do but you I get something the, like that under control? What do you use to wipe those out, and how did they make their way here? Well, it, this is, you know, I talked to the doctors about this. In fact, my book, uh, the end of my book really deals with this question. I talked to the state epidemiologists for both Texas and Oklahoma, and they said, well, you know, climate change is causing the, uh, the, the, the range of this sand fly to move northward uh, into Texas and Oklahoma, along with the wood rat, which is the second host of the disease, because the disease requires not just a sand fly, but it requires a mammal which acts as a host. It's a very complicated disease. So that's what they told me. I mean, it's... Uh, and they said it's spreading. Well, that's also- pleasant. There you go, folks. There's something from Darkness Radio's Beyond the Darkness to you. Keep an eye out on this. And if you get it and you find it's in your area, please let Tim and I know so we can mark that state off as not visitable ever again. Um, well, I mean- well here's, here's something else that's going to make everyone even more worried. <laughs> oh, great. Dogs, dogs and cats get leishmaniasis and can transmit it to humans. And there have been outbreaks of deadly leishmaniasis in dog kennels across the country. Yes. Well, if they can give it to the humans, then, so first of all, don't kennel your dog is what you're saying. Uh, they can only give it to the human through the bite of a sand fly. That's the weird thing about this disease. So if your dog gets leashed in a kennel, but you're in an area that's outside of as the sand fly area, mm-hmm. you aren't going to get it. Mm. So the spreading of the sand flies across the sort of the southeastern part of the United States is a bit concerning. Wow. Yeah, I would say so. I, before we leave, uh, Doug, I do want to talk about kind of the tense relationship between technology, the use of technology, and the archaeological community, because I found that kind of a fascinating aspect of your story. Uh, you know, I mentioned at the beginning there's kind of this asterisk uh, associated now with this find. Um People are really, uh, some of the community is very up in arms regarding LIDAR used on this kind of uh, this kind of massive find. Why is that a problem? 
uh, the whole idea of evolution of of technology is to make jobs easier and to help us uncover. Does it does it mean we could only find these places by stumbling upon them in order for them to count as a real um, expedition? Because to me that sounds ridiculous. Well, you're right. It's, it was really puzzling when the initial discovery was made. There were some archaeologists of the old guard who were very upset, and they said, "Well, look." Um, this discovery was not made by archaeologists. It was made by engineers. Now, this is not right. And uh, also, LIDAR is too expensive. Um, we can't afford it. <laughs> so, But they're, the younger archaeologists are more like, hey, this LIDAR is fabulous. This is the greatest advance for archaeology. So it's, it's a bit what's happening in other parts of the, of the world where there's a lot of disruption going on from high technology. And there's some the old guard is not so happy and the young guard is is happy so the old guard needs a kick in the ass because if you can find things and make it um worth your time i mean imagine the millions upon millions of dollars saved if you were able to pre-map these locations have a good idea of where you're going um and be more prepared for it uh because again you said had you been wandering in that area you probably would have missed it altogether even though you were right there on top of it I mean, we could have walked right past that pyramid and not seen it. Uh, we would have thought it was just a weird hill. But believe me, when, when, they, when they finally get around to LIDARing the Amazon basin, they are going to find really cool stuff. I mean, the lost city of Z is down there somewhere, they, some archaeologists think. I mean, they are going to find amazing things. Um, trust me, in the next 15 to 20 years, all kinds of fabulous stuff is going to be discovered in the jungle using LIDAR. Well, that's exciting in itself, and I can't wait to hear more of these finds, and I'm sure Douglas Preston will be connected to some of them. Uh, Doug, it's been a pleasure speaking with you tonight, and I thank you so much for coming on to share your story. The Lost City of the Monkey God, a true story with us. And uh, the invitation is there. I do want uh, to, to visit with you again in the near future regarding your other book that uh, we discussed off air. I, I don't want to give too much away for our listeners yet, but... Um, we're working on bringing an aspect of our show back that I'd love to have you uh, join us for, so we can count on that, right? Oh, you bet. I I've all, I always enjoy talking to you. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time, Doug Preston. We have links up to the uh, website and information. You can find his website at lostcityofthemonkeygod.com. All one word, lostcityofthemonkeygod.com. You can find him on Facebook at Preston and child preston and child all one word there as well links will be up with the site want to thank our uh, sponsors for this evening amazon.com true car and remember to check out darkness events for all the upcoming events and places you can find tim and i this year as we travel around this great big globe of ours in search of the truth behind the paranormal and i'll be back coast to coasting on march 25th i hope you'll join me tonight though you can listen in when george nori's guests are michael scott lewis and paul kimball Michael Scott Lewis has been a professional astrologer in New York City for more than two decades, specializing in financial astrology and medical chart interpretation. He'll discuss what he sees in charts for the markets and world leaders and why 2020 is shaping up to be very eventful. And in the second half of tonight's show, you can hear the Jack Kerouac of the paranormal, Paul Kimball. He's been experiencing various paranormal phenomena in his travels along the weird highway of life and contends that many of our paranormal and strange experiences are actually interactions with advanced non-human intelligence. That's tonight. You can find information, stations, and more about the topics they cover when you check out Coast to Coast AM. Dot com. Special thanks to our guest, Douglas Preston, for joining us this evening. For Tim Dennis, I'm Dave Schrader, and thank you for listening to the best in paranormal talk radio. We'll be back tomorrow when Dr. Alexandra Sharn joins us. Have you been hexed, recognizing, and breaking curses? We're going to change everybody's lives with tomorrow night's show right here on Beyond the Darkness. <laughs>